Okay, well, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, welcome back to Sustainable Infrastructure, Putting Principles into Practice. I'm Elizabeth Lossis from Duke University, and I'm delighted to have you all join us. Um, before we begin, if you wouldn't mind uh, renaming yourself with your affiliation or country. And um, before we start, I just want to uh, give a few rules of the road. Uh, but first, we'll acknowledge our hosting organizations, which are all represented here. So um, just uh, know that this session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. Please do mute yourself. You'll have an opportunity to talk later. But while uh, the session is going on, we appreciate muting yourself, rename yourself with your affiliation or country. And during the session, please use the chat function either if you have any questions or need technical assistance. If you have a question for the speaker, go ahead and put it in the chat and we will try to come to it when we do the Q&A right after each of our speakers. Or for those of you that can stay an extra 15 minutes, we'll have an open session at the very end where we will try to get to your questions or comments. Um, we have a post-session survey and we really appreciate getting your feedback. Anybody who fills this out will get a certificate of attendance for coming to this webinar today. And finally, there will be a lot of um, resources mentioned during, during today's presentation. Please know that you will get an email in a couple of days with a link to the recording and uh, PDFs of the presentations, as well as all of the links mentioned today. So keep an eye out for this. All right, so we are going to begin, um, as those of you who have come to previous sessions know, we have a polling function um, throughout and we wanna practice it with everyone. There will be a link in the chat. So please take a moment to tell us what word, one word you would use to describe your profession and where you are in the world. And just take out your phone or do it uh, on, your, um, on your computer. So as a reminder, this series has several different objectives. And one of them is just to provide a forum to exchange state-of-the-art knowledge on how to build sustainable infrastructure. We have a library, and I want to uh, highlight this today. If you go back to the Duke Nicholas Institute website, and the link is here and in the chat, you'll find a library of all the recordings up to today in case you missed some of them, as well as we are beginning to put, and this is what the site looks like. The library has all the recordings. We are also beginning to um, put case study write-ups, two or three page write-ups of each of the case studies that have been presented. And a whole bunch of new case studies have now been, um, have been um, loaded onto the site. And by next month, we hope to have a case study write-up for each of the ones that you have heard. So you can reference any of these. Um, one more, uh, just to show you some of the ones that we've been able to put up. So in addition, besides providing these resources, we really hope that this is an interactive forum where you can learn from specialists and specialists can learn from practitioners. And finally, we want to have an opportunity to build a whole community of practice. We're gonna talk about at the end of this session, as you will see, wraps up um, a, year almost of principles of best practices for sustainable infrastructure. We are gonna have one more session next month, a final wrap up session where we'll bring all of these principles together, but also talk about next steps and helping build this community of practice with further webinar series on specific uh, sectors and topics, as well as figuring out how to get resources to each of you that need them 
more on this uh, next month. And also Emily will say a few more words at the end of our session. So moving on to today's session, as you can see, we are to our final principle, our 10th principle on evidence-based decision-making, very exciting. Uh, and if you missed any of the other nine principles, as I said, you can go back and listen. And so for today's session, I want to introduce a colleague that you've met many times from the UN Environment Program, Joe Price, who works uh, on the team on sustainable infrastructure. So Joe, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. And if you've been following um, the 10 principles throughout the series. So as Elizabeth mentioned, we've reached uh, principle number 10, the final one in the International Good Practice Principles for Sustainable Infrastructure, and that's evidence-based decision-making. So on the next slide, um, as we'll learn in this webinar, evidence-based decision-making is important for each phase in the infrastructure life cycle. So looking at the diagram there, um, this ranges from measuring baseline environmental conditions before an intervention or before decisions around uh, construction to ongoing monitoring of impacts on communities. So on the next slide then, this principle states that the planning and management of infrastructure throughout the life cycle should be informed by key performance indicators that should, be, that should promote the collection of data, including data that is disaggregated by stakeholder groups. Regular monitoring of infrastructure performance and impacts is necessary to generate data, which should be made available to all stakeholders. So this principle is essentially split into two different components. Uh, and the first part of it on the next slide is about measurement specifically. So measuring key performance indicators is essential for, for managing the service delivery of infrastructure, but also for value for money and also in terms of the sustainability of an infrastructure system. Monitoring the performance and impacts, positive and negative, uh, enables adaptive management that responds to changing conditions. So this can include um, changing climatic conditions or socioeconomic changes in demand for a particular type of infrastructure. And it helps ensure that infrastructure is fit for purpose, which links back to the idea um, of needs-based infrastructure that reflects the needs of users. And to measure and monitor effectively, data on all stages of the life cycle should be identified and defined, collected, managed and analyzed, and then fed back for decision-making. And this does require certain tools and types of data to understand all the different dimensions of performance and sustainability. And we'll hear more about one um, particular tool in our next uh, technical presentation. The data should include uh, data related to environmental, economic and social sustainability. So the, the three dimensions uh, using common indicators and benchmarking against existing standards. And as best practice, data collected should include spatial data uh, and also data disaggregated by different population groups affected by infrastructure. So this is especially um, marginalized groups or more vulnerable groups affected. And these data should be collected at multiple levels uh, to inform decision making that essentially accounts for impacts at different scales. So a quick example here is the use of uh, spatial data to enable um, suitable identification of an infrastructure site or analyzing data on a landscape scale uh, can also guarantee the functioning of an entire ecosystem during the planning and operation of infrastructure. Then on the next slide, um, the second part of the principle, so the second component covers the importance of data sharing. Because here it's not only important, um, it's not only government decision makers who require data if infrastructure is to be sustainable, but also investors who need clear market signals when making decisions and of course, the public as well should expect to be able to understand the impacts and details of an infrastructure investment and hold decision makers uh, to account. And governments can work uh, actively in partnership with the private sector, civil society and academia to jointly define relevant data and ensure that it's measured, collected, analyzed and synthesized in ways that are useful for decision makers and the wider public as well. But effective monitoring does require good data management and storage capacity that then allows for the continuous sharing across different project and life cycle phases. And so to develop the so-called data or digital infrastructure, it is important to note that many countries may require support or funds to put it in place. 
Um, and we'll go into some of these challenges in a bit more detail um, during the Menti questions, but also potentially in the breakout rooms as well. So for now, that's a quick overview of principle 10 uh, to introduce. And I'll hand over shortly to our next speaker who will go into this topic in some more detail with the technical presentation. Uh, but first we would like to ask the Mentimeter question. So we'd be grateful for, for you to share your thoughts on this. So we'd like to, to know from you what life cycle stage presents the biggest opportunities for evidence-based decision-making. And you can select up to three here. So we have firstly, strategic planning and prioritization, project planning, concept design, procurement and detailed design, or do you think it's finance, the finance phase, construction, operations and maintenance, or decommissioning and repurposing? So yeah, we'd, we'd be really grateful to hear which of those are the priorities for you and please name three. And we have the results here then from the first Menti question, um, which is where you describe your profession. So we've got a good mix here as always. Thanks everyone for, for tuning in. So we've got scientists, engineers, educators on the SDGs, uh, consultant, economists, philanthropists, research manager, African infrastructure. So a really good mix there as always. Thanks everyone. So I'll now, oh, where in the world as well. So let's see where, where everyone's uh, joining from. So we have quite a few from the Netherlands by the looks of things. Uh, also France, a few from the US as always, which is great. Spain, Peru is there, Sri Lanka, Italy, Egypt, again, a really good mix. Good to see. So let's take a look then here at the, the results for the second polling question then. So it looks like the first two, first two phases are those that have been highlighted the most. So strategic planning and prioritization, and also project planning, concept design. We have 13, 14 for each of those, slightly less on procurement and detailed design but it seems pretty clear that the early phases um, are the key, key moments to incorporate evidence-based decision-making and collecting data. So thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. So let's move on then now to introducing our technical presenter, and that's Savina Carluccio, who I think many of you have met, but I'll just provide an introduction to Savina. She's the Acting Executive Director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, ICSI, an experienced civil engineer and infrastructure practitioner. She has 20 years experience advising government, infrastructure owners and operators, multilateral development banks and NGOs to develop and implement inclusive, sustainable and resilient infrastructure that is fit for the future. She has also served as head of guidance and standards at the Resilient Shift, as well as associate director and infrastructure advisor at Arup. So thank you very much, Savina, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Joe, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm delighted to be here today talking about evidence-based decision-making for climate-resilient infrastructure. Next slide, please. So over the course of the last few years working in the resilience space, we've consistently found that a lot of excellent guidance exists, but the landscape is quite fragmented and complex and can be confusing. So practitioners across the life cycle need clarity, consistency, and the access to practical guidance to be able to put resilience in, into practice. So there was a need to create an end-to-end -end guidance with a clear and traceable line of sight for climate resilience. Next slide, please. So Infrastructure Pathways was born to create uh, that resource that addresses that need. It is a resource that was developed by the Resilient Shift in partnership with the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure and delivered by Arab. It aims to organize, explain, and link key existing information, guidance, and tools compiled from hundreds of different resources on climate resilient infrastructure. It summarizes in a concise way what matters for climate resilience and infrastructure. And we've made a very conscious effort to think about what decisions are made by different practitioners at, at different stages of the life cycle and link them to actions that they can take. But I think the most exciting and innovative thing for me is the creation of golden threads for climate for resilience implementation across the life cycle of infrastructure and across the different practitioners 
And so today we're focusing on evidence-based decision-making. Next slide, please. So evidence-based decision-making is sometimes more easily said than done. So, however, if stakeholders across the life cycle can understand where the opportunities are and what decisions are needed at each stage, then it can be possible to plan what to measure, what data and information should be collected, what to monitor, and how we can learn from it. So this is the landing page and the key life cycle graphic for infrastructure pathways. I've also shown the infrastructure, infrastructure life cycle that Joe uh, just uh, briefly uh, flashed on the screen, and that was used throughout the webinar series. And those two infrastructure life cycle, even though one is a cycle and one is a, looks like a, a tube, an underground map, they're actually very aligned. Uh, they're very nicely aligned. Anyway, so looking at different stages now, next please. On the policies and plan, this is the phase of the needs assessment and policy development. So data collection is done at country level and regional level very often. And then government encourages data sharing or disclosure. And then this is when initial performance metrics are developed. Next, please. In the prioritization phase, the collected data are used to develop strategies and pipelines of projects. And they are prioritized for total value over the long life cycle of infrastructure. So not just on the basis of economic growth or financial returns, but also social environmental net positive impacts. And the city water resilience approach in Cape Town, a case study that was presented in a previous webinar, is a tool that supports practitioner in building the project pipeline. And that takes into account system, system perspective. Next slide, please. So, once the project is prioritized, then there is, a, there is a need for further use of advanced decision-making approaches. And so this is when more detailed technical analysis are done, such as, for example, more detailed hazard assessments or analysis as cost-benefit analysis, not in a traditional way, as I said before, not just looking at financial returns. And the case study of, of Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta in Colombia, that was presented also as a previous webinar, was a great example of how a triple bottom line for cost benefit analysis can be developed. Next slide, please. So indicators are increasingly used for making decisions in, for investing in sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So for example, the fast infra sustainable infrastructure label that was presented at a previous webinar is an example of this. And so when we think about climate, climate change, particularly understanding and pricing for climate risk is key to make investment decisions in this phase. Next slide, please. In the design phase, we're really benefiting from open data and from integration of climate change data to then incorporate that and integrate that into into the design requirements. And this is, this is informed by hazard modeling, climate stress testing, and incorporation of monitoring requirement, focusing on climate resilience now, because that's the focus of infrastructure pathways. That can be more broadly, including design requirements for user-centered design, uh, more inclusive design, catering for different groups, et cetera. Next slide, please. So a couple of things of procurements. Uh, so performance-based requirements in contracts, including indicators that relate to resilience and sustainability goals, but also to think about the long life cycle of infrastructure that will experience climate change uncertainty. And so we would need, need to be thinking about how this can inform risk allocation to all the different parties. Next slide, please. In the construction stage, so we've got creation of detailed as-built records. And so we can, we can make use of BIM and, and digital twins, as well as installed sensors or other monitoring equipment. And we've never been in a, in a better position to use digital technology to gather data during the lifespan of infrastructure to then inform decision-making at the next phase. Next slide, please. In the operation and maintenance phase, uh, several parameters are monitored, um, including performance data and including in terms of climate, climate uh, change, climatic and weather data. 
uh, and they are used to inform operational and maintenance decisions. They can also be used to, to um, feed into early warning system and forecasting and to uh, adopt risk-based decision-making uh, for monitoring, uh, predictive and proactive monitoring uh, and maintenance regimes. So finally, end of life, we, uh, we can use performance information to determine the most appropriate time and the most appropriate sustainable approach to end of life for an infrastructure asset. So next, we uh, will be looking at the establishment of metrics and indicators that is the first step for developing an evidence-based decision-making approach. So initial indicators can be developed at the very early stages of a project and reviewed and assessed continually as the project progresses. So these metrics of indicators should be established so that they can be effectively recorded at suitable intervals and should be both output and outcome-based with the latter being more difficult to measure reliably. However, it takes time, planning and investment to collect data and to measure and to analyze and to monitor the impacts. And so this should be factored in, in budgets and in, in planning. There are several different resources that are available for aiding the development of uh, resilience and sustainability indicators. We've got one in the chat, I believe there will be more. Uh, I've got a slide at the end that collates all the different references and will be made, made available to you uh, after the webinar. Next, please. Quickly on monitoring, um, this should be should begin really a policies and plans phase, so very upstream in the infrastructure life cycle to, to be able to monitor re relevant metrics that will then de determine the types of key performance indicators that can be used. And additionally, if there are monitoring data from existing projects, particularly if there's a, the, we've got performance data under climate stresses, they can be a very valuable input for future planning. Just wanted to touch uh, very briefly on adaptable design approaches and monitoring is obviously uh, key in determining when to intervene and uh, monitoring thresholds. And we've got um, in the next presentation, case study presentation, we've got um, more on how this can be done in practice. Next, please. And then finally on data sharing, obviously, Joe has already said it's a very uh, important aspect, particularly valuable from a climate resilience perspective for improving risk assessments and assessing interdependencies between infrastructure networks. So many organizations are eager to benefit from data sharing initiatives, but they are quite reluctant sometimes to share their own data. So government has that vital role to play in recognizing the importance of this and facilitating uh, enacting that as a go between for different organizations and establishing secure and trusted data sharing environment and platforms that can be used by practitioners throughout the life cycle of their infrastructure. And they can, uh, they can also be used to contribute uh, data from, from their own assets and, and projects. So one, one uh, important aspect of data sharing is at the planning, design, and OM stages, open data platforms sharing asset information between different infrastructure networks can allow detailed interdependency and, and cascading failure assessments that can then inform decision making at a system level. And then, next and finally, key takeaways from this very quick overview of a very vast topic. So evidence-based decision-making at its best is a multi-stakeholder effort. There is significant value in understanding what decisions and what data are needed to support them and connecting them across different stages of the life cycle because this encourages system thinking and encourages collective action to towards the implementation of sustainability and resilience in infrastructure. So resources like infrastructure pathways, of which this is only just a very narrow view of what it includes, really help because they draw those connections. So collecting and managing evidence data takes, as I said, planning and investment. And upstream stages, are, which are, tend to be the most data poor, particularly in, in developing country context, present the biggest opportunities for making good decisions that have got potential systemic impacts as the as the Menti meter results showed. And so 
data should also be shared for the public good as far as possible and feedback loops and dissemination of lessons learned from successes, but I would say also failures are absolutely key to improve evidence-based decision-making. So next slide, I think, I believe is the, is the collation of all the different references that I would recommend on the topics of measurement, monitoring and data sharing. And I will stop here and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Savina. Uh, my name is Emily Corwin. I'm a water resources engineer and the director of nature-based engineering solutions at Conservation International. Um, please um, feel free to raise your hand within the Zoom platform or type any questions for Savina in the chat. We've got um, about five minutes here where we can, we have the opportunity to learn more and um, dive into some of the things that she mentioned. Um, we also welcome you to go back to the Mentimeter survey. And there's another question here about what are the biggest barriers to evidence-based decision-making? And I think you can select two. And I know when I was going through this, I wanted to select way more than two. So this is a tough one to choose just two. Um, but some of the challenges could be around lack of data availability, lack of data sharing policies, costs associated with data capture and management, lack of a common set of metrics and indicators, lack of awareness or buy-in from decision makers, and lack of capacity to put it into practice. Um, so Savina, I'm curious, how would you answer this Mentimeter question? Um, which two do you see as some of the biggest challenges or barriers? Um. I probably go for lack of data availability because we need to think about uh, different contexts and we know that some of the developing and emerging economies um, and countries that don't really have data so that's definitely one that I would pick. I'm also a big fan of um, a common set of metrics and indicators so many different people take uh you know obviously i've developed metric and indicators and and they're all perfectly good but i think a common one that then gets used and and you know like and throughout the life cycle albeit in different ways and at different levels i think that would really enhance that uh decision making process and so that's kind of my probably uh, key two ones if I need to select two. Yeah, <laughs> great, thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, any questions for Savina, please go ahead and raise your hand or put them in the chat. I don't see any in the chat right now. Um, so I can have a question for you. It strikes me that um, I really like this, the kind of tube map that you showed, I'll call it, um, and that different types of infrastructure are really unique in terms of the types of key performance indicators and types of data that could be collected. Um, it's And it strikes me, could you picture or imagine different types of infrastructure having unique maps um, that create that framework for what the, the indicators and the the data collection. Um, I guess is there an, are there multiple layers that could be added on here? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Thanks, Emily. Um, so at, at this moment in time, uh, infrastructure pathways hasn't gone into the sector specific guidance. So it's it's been um, quite, uh, I suppose, all sector at, the, at this moment in time. And there are some high level indicators that probably are shareable across sectors. But as you mm -hmm. say, there's then specific sector guidance and specific key performance indicators that should then be made more, should be tailored and made more relevant to specific sectors. So that's uh, that's in the pipeline for for something that you know will be will be added to infrastructure pathways alongside more case studies and alongside in the integration of um, the mitigation pathway because we are at the moment focusing on adaptation, yeah. we can't be talking about adaptation mitigation separately yeah. and have two separate pathways. We should just have one. Yeah. 
Great. Um, another question for you, and I see the, a comment in the chat that there's plenty of data, but the wrong ones, and you need to think in advance about what you need. And you kind of mentioned that government potentially has a key role to play in creating the platform for data sharing. And by doing that, they're almost predefining what type of data, right, that is accepted into that platform. Um, I'm just curious if you could reflect on some of the strengths and limitations of government taking on that role, especially if there are international projects that are transboundary and cross, um, you know, we could benefit from collecting, I guess, data from across jurisdictions. So how do we just, how, who takes the leadership role, I guess, and creating this framework? Right, that's a, that's another barrier actually to, to creating those kind of common uh, or shared data platforms because, you know, like transnational boundaries is uh, they're difficult to manage. Um, I can give I can give maybe a smaller example of, from my practice. Um, and I was working for um, the Greater London Authority, uh, and they created um, a platform, a data share, sharing platform for different infrastructure providers in London, where I'm based. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been um, started as a spatial mapping. But then more and more data are, are being added to the platform. And that is also um, from the requirements of the users. You know, so you start maybe from spatial and then you just add more and more that could be then used um, for, for other applications. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. And before I introduce uh, the next speaker, let's see uh, what the responses were to that second Mentimeter question. Before I do, this is the first Mentimeter question that Joe introduced. So just to share as we've gotten a couple more responses that it seems like the life cycle stage where we see the biggest opportunity here continues to be in the early phases, um, strategic planning, prioritization, and in project planning and concept design. And then this question about what are the biggest barriers to evidence-based decision-making? It looks like many of the respondents, Savina agreed with you around the lack of data availability. Um, and then kind of close seconds are a lack of the common set of metrics and indicators and lack of awareness or buy-in from decision-makers. And I'll add that you know, decision-makers, maybe they're the ones who are a part of funding the collection of different indicators um, are monitoring. So the key to get their, their buy-in as well. All right, well, thank you all for, for your input to that. And thank you, Sabina, for your presentation. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and invite our case study speaker to share his slides while I have the great honor of introducing um, Edgar Westerhoff. Uh, Edgar is Arcadis's North American Director for Flood Risk and Resiliency. He is a water consultant with 22 years of experience in urban water management, and he was leading the Arcadis participation in the international HUD Rebuild by Design competition, including the winning Big U Plan for the Protection of Lower Manhattan. Edgar was the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient Cities Participation Lead, and recently joined the American Society of Civil Engineers Foundation to co-lead the International Climate Adaptation Working Group in collaboration with ICSI, which Savina is intimately involved with also. So with that, Edgar, I see your slides, and if you want to put them in presentation mode, I think we're ready to go. A slight challenge here with the presentation mode being behind that bar. Let me quickly change that. Take your time, no problem. Yeah, somehow it's not popping up. Sorry, uh, would you mind to share the slides for me? Absolutely. Let's see. 
There we go. Can you see them okay? I can see them. Yep, very good. Thank you. Great. Well, to the title, uh, Evidence Based Approaches, we'll be talking about New York City mostly and also reflect uh, on the situation in New York City, uh, looking at the city of, uh, of Rotterdam. I'm uh, quite familiar uh, with both places. I live in New York City, but I've been trained, educated, and worked uh, for almost 15 years uh, in the Netherlands, also in and around uh, the city of Rotterdam. So there's an interesting uh, parallel in how these uh, uh, metropolitan places prepare. And, you know, while you look at this iconic image, the result of the rebuilt by design competition, the big U, we'll be talking uh, a bit more about that. Let's uh, take a step back to where it started. And that's the next slide. So, you know, talking about evidence-based approaches, this, this yeah, photo reveals a lot, of course. Uh, what you see here basically is a failing uh, city. This was back in 2012, uh, when uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, flooded the New York City region completely. And it took the, the region by surprise in many ways. And when I say in, in many ways, you, you see a couple of asset types uh, that caused, uh, in this case, Manhattan to stop functioning. People couldn't go to their work. I was in New York uh, at that time myself. I saw how the city prepared. I also saw the next day how the city basically came to a stop. Came to a stop because our generation that was not longer functioning. Telecommunication, you know, there was no internet services. People couldn't work in their offices. Um, hospitals that were shut down. Physically, people couldn't travel in or out in Manhattan in many cases. The tunnels were flooded. There was no subway. Uh, but also a realization that all these uh, assets and systems interrelate. And that is also where the solutions uh, process started. And, you know, we are 10 years uh, further down the road and a lot of plans has ha have happened. You know, there's a big book work um, that the city is still more or less following that is giving the agenda for everything resilience and all the things that can happen. And in many ways, we are still following uh, that book work. And, we can uh, reference that later after this presentation. Let's move on to the next slide when we talk a little bit more in detail. So for New York City, this very much yeah, started this whole exercise by really getting into the data, like what happened to us um, and what is the future going to be hold? You, know, you see the, uh, the floodplains as they, uh, the, the once in a hundred year floodplains in uh, the current ones in light blue, but also the future ones in darker blue. And you see how water is creeping up to uh, and into and onto uh, the, the, the urban and developed uh, uh, land zones, mostly about around Jamaica Bay, where you know there's less elevation, but also on the right side you see Manhattan. And yeah, a pretty dire future. I'm not showing the animation here on the, uh, in the middle, but it shows you how far water is coming uh, if nothing uh, were to happen. And that is where we are currently. Uh, looking at, so if we take a look at the next slide. We started planning for the long term. I think that's one of the approaches New York City took, very much being aware of the so-called critical assets, you know, the telecommunication I mentioned, power supply, hospitals, sewage treatment plants, but at the same time, the city uh, was taking a longer term perspective. What is the situation in 100 year, working with our data, sea level rise, uh, projecting that sea level rise with uh, the current once in a hundred year floodplain, and how do we address that situation? And for Manhattan, uh, we came up with a, a plan as part of the uh, rebuild by design process. A lot can be found online on that process. But for the Big U, we yeah we went through the, this iterative planning process. We brought many stakeholders together, and with many I mean over forty five uh, different uh, stakeholder groups that brought to the table. And we started this planning process. You know, what is our abstract ambition, which you can say is captured on the number one? And what is the outcome that we envision? And how do we yeah, capture the right challenges, number two? And how do we mitigate those challenges on the number three? And we were really forced by yeah, the, the, the process organization behind Rebuild by Design, which was uh, led out of uh, Federal HUD, Federal HUD uh, program. Uh, to come up with this process. Don't take the process for granted. Don't assume that people you know, share that same uh, set of uh, understanding when it comes to the challenges. No, you really have to work those challenges, explore them, uh, 
and try to understand how you can mitigate those challenges and embed certain solution strategies into a comprehensive plan that is uh, uh, that includes like all the aspects and all the values that you want to capture in your resilience approach. Go to the next. And I mean, what has been really important, you know, where I started, you know, data. And this image comes from uh, our Low Manhattan Financial District master plan. We currently uh, are wrapping up that plan. But these are the, the kind of graphics that speak. You see that middle dotted line, which is approximately the, uh, the current uh, waterfront elevation. And you see how water is slowly creeping up. Right now, the high tides sit just below that uh, dotted line, a couple of feet. But by 2050, uh, water during uh, a high tide will uh, overflow the waterfront edge. And in many other cities, this is already the reality. In Boston, there are certain pink tide events, uh, the sunny day floods in Miami, and we see this happening all over the place. And yeah, the situation in by 2100 will become really problematic. And by that time, you know, the high tides uh, would bring four to five feet above the existing uh, waterfront line at financial district. Um, also do realize that there's many places around the city, 540 miles of coastline, with a substantial lower uh, uh, elevation. And that's where the issues uh, will be even more extreme. This is the kind of data that we work with. So let's take a look at the plan itself. And, you know, working with that iterative planning process, working with stakeholders, uh, community groups, uh, and for those of you familiar in uh, New York City, on the left, you see the FDR uh, drive or you know, the landscape underneath the FDR drive. Not very uh, interesting or appealing. Uh, I would say it's not even functional. It doesn't really serve a, a function other than parking your car, uh, but you can't really take benefit from that landscape. And what we've tried to do uh, working with these groups is to yeah, get a feel how they would use uh, the space if we are going to make um, you know, that so-called first compartment, the east side coastal resilience plan, that first stretch of two and a half miles more resilient. Of course, we have to bring in elevation, elevation that keeps water out of the 100 year uh, floodplain. And as a result, we are taking that whole community out of the floodplain and do realize you know, taking a community out of the floodplain that is over 30,000 households and businesses that are no longer located in that future floodplain. But how do we do it such that it brings benefit to the community? I think that is a very important part of what we are trying to accomplish. Maybe in the discussion, we can talk a little bit more about financial implications of uh, doing this as a program, because what you hear see is also quite high end. See the next slide, please. Yeah. So um, also a lot of challenges. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, what you don't see is the main challenge. So if the big U for the future of Lower Manhattan uh, will pass this area, you also need to address the underground situation. And that is going to be very costly. So you, know, you just saw the first uh, section along the East River uh, at a cost of 1.5 billion. I think it's fair to assume that 30 to 40% uh, of the capital needed uh, will be spent below ground. Did we just lose them? Did we lose Edgar? I think we have. Um, <laughs> you lost me for a second, sorry. Well, good, now you're back, that's great. <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure where exactly you, you lost me, but you know, this talks about the underground challenges and yep. uh, if Manhattan is going to protect uh, itself, uh, I think it's fair to assume that 30 to 
of the cost will be spent below ground. So you will not see it uh, in the above ground solutions. Let's move on. Um, so the first phase is uh, being constructed as we speak. This is the financial district uh, master plan. You see on the image on the left uh, in dark blue, you see the buildings, uh, the high rise offices that are currently located in the floodplain. Uh, what we are doing here is exploring a so-called hybrid solution where through land reclamation in the East River, um, elevated land reclamation, we are going to protect the city. This has been studied for the second time and first on the Bloomberg and we are now uh, wrapping up our master plan and that is likely uh, going to uh, see uh, an implemented plan in the, the upcoming years. And with a hybrid solution, you know, that means that where we have space, uh, we, will, we will create elevated uh, open landscape parks and where we don't have a lot of space, we will be working with walls um, and also walls integrated in, uh, in park spaces. Let's move on. Uh, identity is a very important one, you know, working with your current assets. Uh, you know, this of course is uh, and used to be a, uh, a touristic uh, attraction. Tens of millions of people are visiting uh, this part of the waterfront. So, you know, building identity is an opportunity, but I think the next slide puts a couple of things in perspective, and that is who is going to take benefit of the situation. And, you know, climate equity is a, a very important uh, aspect. I would say since the, what is it like the 2018, 2019 protest, Black Lives Matter, uh, it has completely changed the way we do our business because um, through planning, you have a way to adjust, to modify, and also better calculate who is going to benefit from the interventions, the longer term plan uh, that you come up with. And equity, I think, is one of the main drivers uh, in our resilience planning work these days. It's basically what you're seeing here is the dashboard that you can play with. You can tweak each of these aspects and yeah, plan it such that certain community groups take more benefits than other, others. And that is exactly uh, the objective here. Let's move on. So we're switching gears now and uh, no worries, we will come back to uh, with a wrap up with some conclusions and lessons learned, but we are shifting gear here now to the city of Rotterdam. Uh, city of Rotterdam, highly challenged uh, with a long history uh, in managing water in a sustainable way, you see, our water uh, is, uh, is challenging uh, this, uh, this port city, uh, around 800,000 people. So I would say 10% of uh, the New York metro area with over 8 million people. Um, but let's take a closer look at what is really driving uh, water safety uh, in a city like Rotterdam. And that is, you know, captured in this simple uh, formula, flood risk, probability multiplied by consequence. I think you all understand that the consequence can be extreme if about 90% of your city is at or below sea level. And that is exactly the situation in the city of Rotterdam. Everything that is uh, on the bottom right image that is blue or uh, lightly colored is below sea level and brown is sitting at sea level. So you can understand without the levee system, the primary uh, protective alignment, Rotterdam would not function as a city uh, as it currently does because of all the assets uh, that are at risk. Assets that are also constantly growing because our population is growing. So, you know, these facilitating processes that increase the consequence can be mitigated, of course, through, uh, through adaptation. Um, and I show a couple of examples without going into any detail here that give a little bit more uh, understanding how that is happening and has happened in the Netherlands. And, you know, of course, protective alignments up to a yeah, protective standard uh, of once in a 10,000 year, compare that with New York City, where we are discussing uh, once in a hundred year in the Netherlands, it's up to once in a 10,000 year uh, level of protection. Um, but we have shifted gear. You know, our um, uh, uh, levy systems, as you can see on the left, Katwijk, uh, is also very much about multifunctionality. You, know, you try to combine various functions and 
in the Katwijk uh, coastal case, there used to be a lot of uh, cars parked during the summer. But now these parks, uh, these cars are integrated in a parking uh, space, which is embedded in a natural dune system, which in turn protects uh, the community up to that once in a 10,000 year level. On the right side, you see Duck Park uh, in Rotterdam, Roof Park. Uh, this used to be a struggling neighborhood, um, a struggling neighborhood where they had um, um, uh, a responsibility to upgrade uh, the levy system, uh, bring it up to par. And the way that was done was through an elevated park uh, landscape. But also in this park, there's parking integrated, there's a shopping mall integrated. And just like with the parking, you know, it's generating revenue. And that is really, they're changing the community in many ways. And people also take uh, much more ownership now. This used to be as a struggling area, and now people start to, to fell it uh, their environment. Uh, let's move on. We're not going to talk too much about the coastal strategies, but let's take a, a, a quicker look at what is happening with urban uh, adaptation. Because being below uh, sea level means that you are basically living in a bathtub. And when it rains, extreme precipitation, you, know, you need to find places to store that water. And storing water in, uh, in the Netherlands or in a city of like Rotterdam has very much to do with how much it's going to cost. What is your objective? How much water do you need to store? And how much is that going to cost you? This is a large scale, uh, over a million and a half uh, cubic meters can be stored in this area, but it also brings co-benefits. You see a couple of uh, factors here, you know, there's uh, an ecological corridor, so it's, uh, it provides uh, natural um, benefits. Um, it's attract attractive uh, park landscape as well, but mostly it's to store water. It's to store water at a low cost because the next example is an inner city example. And that's what you've probably seen before. And that is the water squares Rotterdam has practiced uh, the, uh, the application of water squares in many places. Uh, so on the normal circumstances, this uh, uh, open space can be enjoyed uh, by people uh, playing ball or, uh, or uh, church services on Sunday even. Uh, but when it's raining, this can also fill up uh, temporarily with water. Um, the last aspect um, you know, that also speaks to the bathtub uh, uh, challenge uh, is the city still recharge program that Rotterdam started uh, only a few years ago through a program called CoStar. Uh, we can link uh, more to that uh, in the presentation, but it's really about pushing back salt water and allowing fresh water, rain water uh, to be stored in uh, your urban environment uh, and store it such that it can be uh, reused. So there's um, a multitude of sensors that's been located throughout the city to really understand um, yeah, where these buffers can, uh, can be created and also where certain needs uh, are in terms of reuse of, uh, of water. So I'm going to wrap it up with the next slide. And I realize, uh, Elizabeth, that there's uh, a lot of content on here, so maybe you know, during the Q&A or the breakouts, I'm going to touch on only uh, a couple of them. So what are some of the, uh, the challenges and also yeah, the lessons learned? Uh, I think what New York City and Rotterdam have uh, in, uh, in common these are complex uh, urban environments and whatever you do needs to be retrofitted. So we don't talk about new developments. You need to retrofit a higher level of protection uh, in your urban environment. And that is very complex. In the Netherlands, that's happening in a very systematic way. So talking about bioswales or large scale water storage, it's all part of that systems approach. And I would say that systems approach is not really in place yet uh, in New York City. We are talking about it but we also know that we have many more decades uh, to go. Um, legal and regulatory constraints, I think uh, a big difference between the Netherlands and US in general, uh, water safety is regulated by law in the Netherlands. So there's no discussion whether once in a 10,000 year is okay, or if it should be less or more, it is once in a 10,000 year, or if you are close to a river, it's once in a 4,500 year or in city areas, it's once in a 50. No one is questioning uh, those rules. And that helps because it avoids a lot of discussion. Equity, I've talked about it. So let's uh, mention a couple of things um, about governance and political challenges. I'm going to the fourth bullet, uh, uh, over-regulation and too much governance. And I think with the climate challenges 
uh, that you saw on one of the first slides, you know, six to eight feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. We have tremendous challenges ahead of us and only a few decades ahead of us. The Netherlands is, I would say, in many ways, over-regulated. There's so much governance in place, the federal level, the province level, the city level, the water boards, everyone is they are playing with the same set of issues. Above all that is the European Union, uh, who is dictating, well, close to 80% of the rules, I believe, uh, when it comes to water safety coming out of the European Union. So if you are over-regulated, it slows down the process and we have no time to lose. I think that's a benefit to uh, many of the cities in the US, including New York City. Um, a financial and economic challenge, um, and also some lessons learned is about public-private partnerships. You, you've seen the roof park, duck park example from Rotterdam. That is a public-private partnership. That is where the private sector has found um, uh, the public sector and together they make these, uh, these plans happen. Um, maybe one thing to touch on as well with the, as a technical and programmatic challenge, and that is the challenge of retreat, coastal retreat. Because we know, even in the Netherlands, that there may not be enough funding to address the situation 100 years from now. You know, New York, 540 miles of coastline, I think about 60 miles has seen a plan. That means close to 500 miles has not seen a plan. And take that into account when you know, we, we start to plan for 2050, two to three feet of sea level rise by that time. Uh, we will see coastal retreat. We will see through zoning, um, that there will be a move uh, away from the waterfront to higher ground. And that is a process that also needs to, be, uh, needs to be planned for. And that's also, I think, where cities like Rotterdam uh, and New York City can learn from each other. Um, and you know, retreat, let's also keep in mind, that's not about giving up. It's also, in many cases, repurposing existing lands that will be abandoned. For example, uh, the city of Miami, uh, you know, retreat, means repurposing, and repurposing means giving benefit uh, to uh, a place, a piece of land uh, that others can take benefit from. I think that's uh, with the last slide uh, where uh, we will be ending. Um, and the last slide is uh, showing that, I mean, at least uh, on a personal note, I would say it's a lot of fun to work with these uh, challenges. Um, with that, happy to take uh, some questions. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Edgar. That was uh, terrific. And you really covered a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, different issues there. Before I ask you a question, I want to just remind people, if you do have to leave before the breakouts, please do take a moment to answer our post-session survey, which will be put in the chat again. And um, there is at least one question in the chat, which is pretty specific. So I'm gonna hold that question until after we come back from the breakouts for anybody who could stay longer. We are uh, running a little short on time. So I'm just gonna ask you one question uh, and hold other questions until later because I have a million questions from that, that great presentation and Savina's as well. But one of the things I thought was really nice was you not only you took this issue and really touched on many of the principles we've been talking about all year, beginning at strategic planning and systems-based planning and participatory uh, planning and nature-based solutions and uh, sustainable finance, inclusion, et cetera. I'm curious if you could, um, just say a few more words on how this issue of evidence-based decision-making and using data helps with some of these issues like the equity and inclusion issue. Um, you mentioned that relocation is likely gonna be necessary. How do you use this evidence-based decision-making to help with some of these really thorny issues like you know, equitable relocation. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it's almost touching on uh, what, what, what came up in the previous presentation um, that, you know, 
yes, we have a lot of data. I think what we also start to realize is that uh, before making any decision on you know, areas that can be protected uh, in the future, there's so much that comes uh, into play that we currently don't even uh, have in mind. You know, also in the Netherlands with the floods as recent as 2021, the flood disasters in Germany, Belgium, you know, we just start to realize what we don't know and what planning for the extreme means. Because you know, I showed examples from Hurricane Sandy. Last year, we had Hurricane Ida uh, with even more casualties. And that, you know, even after 10 years of studying, is completely changing the way, once again, on how we, um, for example, take compound flooding into account. So not just uh, uh, through storm surge, but also extreme precipitation and bring those two together. How is that going to inform your planning process in a different way? And if you bring uh, socioeconomic factors uh, to that, um, it will inform and tell um, in a way that we currently may not even understand uh, what should happen in certain places. So through uh, computer learning, artificial intelligence, uh, emerging data sets that we currently don't even have, um, we can play with that. You know, the, the breakdown I showed in the economic analysis is a very uh, basic way to do that. But at this point, you may even argue like, is that the right tool uh, to do that? Because we know where the gaps are, uh, which is a great start. You don't know where the gaps are means that you know where to do uh, more research. Uh, and, and also touching on one of the questions in, uh, in the Q&A, the chat box. You know, there's so many factors that we currently uh, are not planning for, like land subsidence. That's another factor. So talking about compound flooding and future risks, not the current risk, but the future ones, yeah, really forces you to, to think about future data sets that we currently probably don't even have. So the use of digital tools um, and new ways to, yeah, to plan with data um, is, I would say, yeah, a number one um, uh, a factor that, that we, where we need to make much more significant steps. Otherwise, you know, we, we may plan for future regrets, and that's not what we want because you know, funding, of course, is is a is a challenging resource uh, with all the, the world issues currently. So, how do we do this in a smart way without losing speed? Because we have to speed up this process. Um, so, there's many forces. Um, that come into play, but data, I totally agree with the previous uh, and Savina's presentation, you know, having our data in place, knowing where we have data gaps and data that we need to study and work is a number one. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, that is a great intro to a couple of the breakout questions that we are um, going to ask everyone to um, think about. And so in a moment, we are going to um, sort you randomly into small groups and just have just about a eight, 10 minute discussion on these two questions. Please, um, during or, or as you're coming back, put your comments into the Menti link, the answers to these, just your top line comments. The first question is, for each of you, can you share examples of successful evidence-based decision-making that you've uh, experienced? And then second, what should or could be done to overcome the challenges of applying evidence-based decision-making in the development of sustainable infrastructure, some of those earlier challenges we spoke about? And is there a particular sector that you think needs to take a leadership role in addressing this? So Sarah is going to um, sort everyone. We hope you can join us um, Again, also don't forget to do your um, post-session survey uh, before leaving us. And with that, and we will see you all back here uh, in I'm thinking about eight minutes. And then we'll also, after we wrap up, have a uh, open forum for until the half hour. All right, welcome back. Let's see if I can present here. So I just am gonna share my screen um, with some of the, the comments that 
were captured um, in those very brief breakout rooms. So this was exam the first was on examples of successful evidence-based decision making. Um, I know one, here's one ex specific example from the Mui River in South Africa and the determination of environmental flows completely altered the plans for dam construction and IBT. So one entire dam was maybe found to not be needed. And there was one example in our group from Montreal, a bridge corridor project where Envision was used successfully um, to inform and create a framework for decision-making. So the second question about what should or could be done to overcome challenges, education of policymakers and officials and sexy examples. And just to go a little deeper into that, I think one of the things that came up in our group was really about appealing to bias and emotions and people's, um, you know, there's using data in a way that appeals to the kind of that, that bias and emotion is really important. Uh, education on SDGs, sustainable development goals. Um, great. So thank you all for, for your inputs. Um, yeah, just it seems like many of these are touching on the need to have a compelling and supportive narrative that accompanies any data that's that's collected to inform decision making. And just noting that we are pretty much right at time. Um, welcome everyone to stay for the, the top of the half hour. Um, we'll be here just having an informal conversation. Um, and we also will welcome you to join us next month for our concluding session. I can't believe it's been a year. Uh, we're going to do an overview and wrap up of all of the 10 good practice principles and introduce our next steps for building this sustainable infrastructure community of learners. And we're particularly looking forward to a presentation from Bruce Strumminger, who is with Project ECHO, uh, which is what this series has been modeled after is the approach that Project ECHO uses for case-based learning. Um, so he'll be sharing what we can learn from their model in the public health sector. So with that, um, I will stop sharing and welcome, thank you all for attending and we'll transition into our informal conversation. Okay, thank you, Emily. And um, if anybody has any questions, please just raise your hand or put something in the comment. Um, in, in the, the chat function, but I am going to start by, um, as I promised her earlier, I, I think Edgar, you did answer the question in the um, chat function, but I said you would come back to it. So just before we start with anything else, did you wanna say anything else? Uh, if you could just remind people what the question was um, before we move to other topics. I believe there was a question about land subsidence. This, you're referring to the question on the Netherlands? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, land subsidence, of course, you know, it, it's, um, it's an integral part of um, yeah, what we call relative sea level rise. You know, sea level goes up, uh, land sub subsides. Uh, you know, we have that challenge uh, also in, uh, say, in coastal Louisiana. Uh, the Gulf Coast is, you know, land subsidence is a much bigger factor than sea level rise. Uh, of course, it is also a factor in the Netherlands. This is also where that coastal, that that, uh, that example that I gave, comes um, uh, or becomes very relevant because, we, at one hand, we need to pump, but we don't want to pump too much because, as a result, we draw in salt water. Uh, so we want to store water uh, in fresh rainwater uh, in our soils and. Um, also to avoid land subsidence because the more we extract and pump, you know, the faster the land subsidence will grow. So it's very much, you know, an, an, yeah, a, a, a holistic challenge um, and trying to address that requires a uh, thorough understanding of you know, extreme precipitation. 
sea level rise and basically the far angles that I showed coming uh, into and around Rotterdam um, and trying to address them as yeah, comprehensively as, as possible. And I think again, what the, um, what the flood disaster last year showed in Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, you know, which we in a way address through uh, the program Room for the River uh, after the 1995 floods, but it proved to be yeah, insufficient. You know, we need to upgrade that plan from 20 years ago, because now we need to plan for the extreme uh, climate extremes and bring that into the equation, rerun the models with what the future uh, will bring. And, and to be clear, you know, the future is now, the future is not in 20 years from now. We are living the, the future, the extremes, uh, as we've seen, because Germany would have never thought that, you know, they would have had to regret like 180 casualties because of a flood in Germany. You know, that, that was, is unheard of. So it, it makes us rethink what needs to happen. And I mean, hurricane season in the US is around the corner. And yeah, unfortunately also this year, there will be many billions in damage again and again and again. So we need to plan for this um, in a comprehensive way. And I mean, and we need to think about it all. It's not just the sea level rise numbers. It's also extreme precipitation and Probably in many places in the US, we need to plan such that we avoid uh, loss of life. Um, so not even uh, thinking about co-benefits and all those beautiful high-end uh, outcomes. No, it's avoiding loss of life. I think that is the priority that we need to plan for. Uh, Palivi, Monday, do you want to, uh, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I was curious, Edgar, you mentioned Boston in, in passing. Um, I, I live in Boston, so my question is specific to how you think the um, approach that you had followed for, for New York City, uh, the big U, um, can translate into you know, what we are seeing in Boston. I, I'll just say two other things. Given that they are, you know, three different rivers that are um, sort of emptying into the harbor, the the um, Charles, the uh, uh, Mystic, and the Neponset, and all of them have uh, different, uh, you know, hydrologic and uh, other characteristics. But uh, do you have a sense of, you know, what what might um, work in terms of applying the same approach as the big U? Edgar, before you answer that, I want you to hold that thought. Uh, I know Sabine is going to have to leave us shortly. And so I had one question I wanted to get her to respond to, and then, and then we'll turn back to um, answer the Boston question. Um, Sabina, the uh, infrastructure pathways that you put up can you give us, um, and I apologize if I missed this, but is it live right now? And who are your target audiences? And um, in particular, if someone here wanted to use it, what would they, how would they, how do you envision this, this working in the future with the infrastructure pathways? Uh, you are muted. I'm mute, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, for this question. I, I um, it is live. It is a live resource, um, and it is kind of, and it will be kept live because it is a compilation of uh, best uh, in class guidance. Uh, so it needs to be kept uh, current. So publication pop up <laughs> every day. So, so maintenance, ongoing maintenance, is one thing. But in terms of usage, so at the moment they. The target audience, as you put it, actually we've been ambitious, and and there is a, a little bit for everyone. So you, you the all stakeholders in the life cycle have got uh, resources that are relevant to them, because you know like climate resilience has got you know you oper they operate they've got different entry points across, um, so they will know where they operate right um, government in the in the kind of the more upstream phases or owners operators probably be interested in also in the operation and maintenance etc. There are there is a feature. There are different features, but there is a feature where you can, if you are a government, 
target, you know, stakeholder or user. You can go and you can filter out the content that is particularly relevant to government, where government needs to take and lead action. And so you can go and you can directly navigate to the content that is relevant to you. But at the moment, it's very, it's it's a very comprehensive um, website. And we are working uh, to make it a bit more bite-sized and digestible because you know people don't really have that much time to navigate. Or maybe if you're really interested, you you do. And I I in my day job go back to it several times. So I guess that speaks uh, speaks for the quality of the resource. But um, but you know if you're a city official, you don't really have the time to spend and reading through and therefore we are kind of distilling down into what really you know if it's a checklist to be used on projects if it's a template that we're suggesting is using for procurement of infrastructure is if it is so something that is more digestible and so that's kind of the next step in addition to sex specific guidance and mitigation uh, and I, content i assume if there are people who here who use go to your site and notice something missing, they should contact you. They should, and, and there is a collaboration um, um, sort of, um, you can click on collaboration, get in touch. And, uh, and we are very happy to hear from anyone who suggests something that miss, is missing or ways to, you know, even feedback to how to improve it. Okay, well, we know you have to run to your next meeting, but thank you for the great presentation. And um, I see that Edgar has already started his uh, by by posting a link. Uh, and just I will also note that there was a very interesting New York Times article just a couple weeks ago on Jamaica Plains, which talked about a lot of these issues, which also would be worth maybe I'll throw that into the chat if I can pull that out. But Edgar, do you want to say anything else on the Boston question? I think you might be. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, and I, I, I copied uh, Climate Ready Boston, the link to the reporting. Yep. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I copied the link to Climate Ready Boston in the chat. Um, I mean, Boston has studied the region quite efficiently. Let's start with the positive. Um, so in only a couple of years, three, four years, uh, through crime Boston, East Boston, South Boston, downtown area, um, they've increased their understanding in you know, taking big steps compared to New York City. New York City has elevation, and that is your friend. So there's really no place to go in Boston because it's basically one big uh, top lane. Uh, as Arcadis, we've done uh, Climate Ready Boston, and as a result of after that, we did Climate Ready South Boston with the Seaport District. And the Seaport District, uh, to some, was celebrated as a success of the 90s and 2000s, where you know, massive developments have, have taken shape. But that, you know, is, I think, a a huge regret in the making if nothing is, is happening um, because it's sitting there. You know, it, um, it's a fantastic area from a distance, but then imagine uh, even higher levels of sea level rise by the end of the century, uh, which can uh, be as extreme as eight to 10 feet for Boston. Um, with water already during king tides, once or twice a year, you know, overtopping uh, the waterfront edge. Um, you know, that's where retreat gets a different meaning. I think what we will see in Boston is retreat through yeah, repurposing ground elevations of buildings, um, which might be easier for some of the newer developments than the historic uh, buildings. Well, there's also many historic, but it's going to become a natural for, uh, for Boston. Um, not even, you know, to talk about you know, the infrastructure that is uh, hidden and buried in, into the ground. Now there's a massive challenges. Also Logan International Airport, which is just sitting a couple of feet above high tide. Uh, you know, the East Boston area is, is very challenging because of the lack of uh, elevation. So I think it, the solution will come, I would say naturally, but naturally means forced in, in in, in many ways.
if Boston is not able to figure out new financial means to pay for what is needed, um, and with financial means, you know, that could also bring uh, solutions like, you know, let's forget about insurance because an insurance premium you know, doesn't give you a savvy bring uh, or bring the premiums together and buy a collective solution uh, where you reduce your risk. That might be a much yeah, better approach uh, because what we showed for New York 2030, uh, that's also the rea reality of Boston. By 2030, every high tide will break the waterfront edge. So it's another 10 years. Um, and that's when reality kicks in. Also the market reality, the economic reality. And that will dictate, I think, for Boston what is going to happen and also how new uh, high-rise offices will be repurposed. But it's at the end of the day, it's about buying time for Boston because Boston, just like Miami, is in a dire situation. I hope that gives not too much of a positive perspective, but um, it's, yeah, it's difficult for Boston. Um, no, that's very helpful. Thank you so much, Edgar. Appreciate those remarks. You're welcome. Great. Well, we are at time, and so we don't want to keep people long. I do hope you all will join us for our final wrap-up session, but also help us give your input on what's worked and where we should be going next. We've got some great ideas, but um, particularly those of you who have stuck with us through the whole uh, session, we would love to, to get your input on what would be most valuable. So thank you. See you in May. And um, thank you again, Edgar, for um, a terrific and um, very um, sort of overwhelming uh, presentation. Thank you.